We start with the 5090 O-Level Biology, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, November 10, 2017, paper 1-2. We've done the paper 1-1 one, one, and this will be the second paper that we are doing for the November 2017 exam. Now, starting with question number one, we can see the diagram shows cells in the epidermis of a leaf. Q is the guard cell and P are the cells of the epidermis. They've taken a layer off from the uh, bottom of the leaf. To complete the diagram, which structures would be added to P and Q? Now, you've got to understand is that P is the epidermis, so it does not have any chloroplasts in it. Q is the um, guard cell. Now, Q will have chloroplasts in it. That is why you see here, Q has chloroplasts in it. So this is what we have to remember is that Q has the chloroplasts in it. So you will draw the chloroplasts, I mean, like we would need to draw the chloroplast inside the guard cells. But uh, there is, yes, the nucleus has already been drawn in Q. So the nucleus is there. You can see this is the nucleus. And then P is the epidermis. So you only need to draw the nucleus in that. So we can draw that with a blue color. So this would be the nucleus in P. So we need to draw the nucleus in P. So this is what we need to draw. But of course, epidermis cells do not have a chloroplast. So please remember that. So this is why this was the correct answer. Then coming on to question number two, by which process does water vapor pass over the leaf? Now, when you look at water vapor, it's not water, it's a gas. So if it's a gas, it has to be diffusion. It can't be osmosis. And water vapor passes out of the leaf. So you know, this is the leaf, the cuticle, then this is the upper epidermis, and then you have the palisade mesophyll, and then you have the spongy mesophyll, and then you have to understand is that the water evaporates. The water is on the surface or like a film of water around the spongy, and then it evaporates. And then it, of course, moves out of the lower epidermis. It's got the guard cells, and then it's got this. So the water vapors are going to just pass out here. So water vapors are going to diffuse out. So it's going to be diffusion. It's not going to be translocation or active transport or osmosis. There's no partially permeable membrane, so it cannot be osmosis. And translocation is the movement in the phloem. And active transport is that of ions into root hair cells. Here, there's no active transport. Question number three, a student takes a potato and cuts three pieces from it. Each piece is five centimeter into 0.5 and into 0.5. He places the three potato pieces into three different sugar solutions. After two hours, he removes the potato pieces from the sugar solutions and measures their length. The results are shown in the table. Now you can see X and Z have increased in length. So that means they have outside, there was a higher water potential. So water moved in and the potato absorbed water and they became more turgid, the cells of the potato. And so there has been an increase in size. The increase in size is greater in Z is 5.3. So originally they were 5. Now it's 5.2 or 5.3. And of course in Y, they have become shorter. So that means water has moved out. In Y, what has happened? Water has moved out of the cells. So the cells have sort of shrunk a bit. And so they have become uh, less in length. These potato strips or these potato chips have become less in length. They're not chips because they've not been fried. They're just raw potato pieces. Now, solution Y has a lower water potential than the potato. What does this mean? It means that this is the potato piece and water has moved out. So that means inside this potato, this is the potato. So inside the potato, there was a higher water potential and outside was a lower water potential. That is why the water has moved out and that is why it has shrunk. So solution Y has a lower water potential than the potato. Others are all wrong. Solution Z has the lowest no. Potato piece in X decreases and because it takes up sugar. Now takes up sugar, this is all rubbish. This is something which you should know immediately. This Any student who doesn't know that is that when you're piece, placing the pieces in a sugar solution is actually because inside the cytoplasm, the plant also has some sugars in it. And so there is some uh, solutes in it. So if you put it in just plain water, then water is just going to get in and they're just going to get bigger. But when you put them in different sugar solution, that's how you can find out what is the concentration of the cell sap or the cytoplasm, because the one in which there is no increase in length, that means there has been no net movement of water in that 
and that would be the concentration of the uh, cell sap or whatever the concentration inside the cell is. So this was question three. Then coming on to question number four. Let's look at four. According to the lock and key hypothesis, what is the lock and what is the key? So lock, you know, is always the enzyme. So you have to see which are the enzymes. Now here, there's only one enzyme. You can guess it by the name, L-I-P, A-S-E. Whenever there is that A-S-E, it's an enzyme, protease, lipase, amylase. So anything with an A is an enzyme. And that was the biggest thing that you have to understand. In the locks, everything else was wrong. This was only one which was correct. And of course, if maybe they put in lipase twice. And then they could have put something else here. So this is what the key had to be. You see, so the enzyme lipase, say this is the enzyme lipase. And what is going to fit into it is only going to be a lipid. Lipase, L-I-P, lipase, lipid. It's very easy to understand it if you can just remember a few things and make it a habit to be clear about it. Question 5. A student investigates the effect of different colors of light on the rate of photosynthesis. In three separate experiments, he shines red, blue, or green light onto an aquatic plant. The number of oxygen bubbles produced by the plant is counted. You know the rate of photosynthesis. So the rate of photosynthesis was being studied and uh, the oxygen bubbles are going to be telling you more the rate of photosynthesis, more the oxygen produced by the bubbles. So each experiment is carried out three times and you take the average number of bubbles. So this is why you increase the reliability. Repeat is to increase the reliability of the results. So in the color of uh, light we have measured here. So first we had red. Red it had 48 bubbles per minute, which was the average. Blue had 37 bubbles per minute average and green had 12 bubbles per minute in the average, the average. What explains the result? Chlorophyll absorbs red and blue light more than green light. Well, in a way, that's right, because you see green light was only 12 bubbles, and this was 48, and this was 37. Now, green light is absorbed by water. Well, why would that be? We are studying the rate of photosynthesis, so this was wrong. Most of the green light is absorbed by chlorophyll. No, you can see green because it is actually reflected back. And red light is used least in photosynthesis, but had the highest number of bubbles. So how could that be right? But please remember, we're studying the rate of photosynthesis. That was the stem of the question. Whenever you read the question, you should be very careful. They're going to give you some questions which are going to check how well you read the questions. And that's one of the biggest problems that we face. Uh, most of you do not read the questions. Then coming to question number six, when is carbon dioxide absorbed and when is it released? When is it absorbed and when is it released by an ecosystem such as a tropical rainforest? Well, it is absorbed during daylight. Why? Because that's going to be the high rate of photosynthesis. And when is it going to be released? In darkness, when the plants are only respiring. We are talking of a rainforest. We are talking of trees. They are not human beings there. So during the day, most of the carbon dioxide used in photosynthesis will be absorbed. During the light, all the trees are respiring. Well, they are respiring during the day as well. But during at night, they are only respiring. There is no photosynthesis. So that is why this was correct. Then question seven, what describes the upper cuticle of a leaf? This was not very clear. Exam report says students were not very clear on that. So uh, relatively few candidates correctly identified the structure and function of the leaf cuticle. A common error was in the belief that the cuticle is a cellular layer. Well, the cuticle is just a non-cellular layer. And then you have the upper epidermis cells. And I always explain to this, like I say, you laminate your uh, biology book or your physics book because you don't want to spill your coffee or your tea on it. So the lamination is that protection which um, God has given to the leaves. And that is the cuticle, which is a non-cellular layer, a thin non-cellular layer preventing water loss from the leaf because there is also cuticular transpiration and that is prevented by the cuticle. Question number eight, blood from the ileum is carried in the hepatic portal vein to the liver. So this is the intestine. And then, of course, this is the liver. And then there is this vessel connecting it. And this vessel connecting it is called the hepatic portal vein. So this is the small intestine. And this is the liver. 
Okay, so amino acids can be converted to urea before they enter the general circulation. Why is that wrong? Because uh, you have to understand this that only the excess amino acids are deaminated, not the amino acids which go straight from the food to the from the intestine to the liver. First, they have to be used by the body, and then the excess amino acids are deaminated. Uh, the answer to this was, of course, excess glucose can be converted to glycogen for storage and not excreted. Otherwise, you would have to remove that glucose, which was not uh, stored and which is not used by the body. But then it is stored in glycogen so that you don't have to eat very, very frequently. The glycogen store is going to come into play. I know you, are, you understand during fasting, we all eat early in the morning and then we eat at uh, sunset. Uh, so you've got all these reserves. That's why we'd have to eat very frequently because glucose would not be stored as glycogen and uh, we would depend on the frequent intake of uh, food. C ensures that fat products pass through the liver before they reach the heart. You must realize hepatic portal vein has no fats in it. There are no fats in the hepatic portal vein because they're going to be carried by the lacteals and they will be entered through the lymphatics and they'll then again enter the bloodstream uh, uh, through the lymphatic vessels and they will enter the subclavian vein and they do not go directly to the liver at all. Then toxic materials can be destroyed before they reach any body cells. No, that's not very correct because toxic materials will not be, there's not the liver is not going to be the detoxifying. First it has to enter the general circulation and then later on other parts of the body will of course remove the toxic material like that's an excretion. Question nine, the table shows the composition of four foods. Which food provides the most energy per gram? which food provides the most energy per gram but you have to have understand why there's got to be only one thing which has to be in excess because energy per gram is more in fats nearly 36 or 37 kilojoules per gram carbohydrates is 16 protein is nearly 17. so if it's 83 percent fat that was the biggest thing which you had to realize is the fat content should have been the highest and then, of course, carbohydrate and protein and water, that's, water was immaterial, that doesn't give you any energy, but basically it was the fat which was going to give you all the energy. Then coming on to question number 10, after eating the pH in the mouth decreases, you have to understand there was some acid. And which statement explain this? A bacteria release acids. In salivary gland do not release any acid. Enzymes in the saliva release acids, that's rubbish. Enzymes, there's only amylase, it converts the starch to maltose. There's no acid. Sensory, in the, and that's all rubbish. Sensory neurons cannot release any acids. Question 11. Which statement about root hairs are correct? They increase the surface area for the plant to take up water. Yes, they increase the surface area for the plant to take up minerals. And that would, of course, somebody who marked this correct would really not know any biology. How can a root hair photosynthesize? That was absolute rubbish. And it was something it would be sad if somebody really figured that and thought it was three because how can root hairs photosynthesize? I mean, I'm, I'm surprised how anybody could get that wrong. Question 12, the diagram shows a section through a plant stem. And you know vascular bundles, the inside are the xylem, outside are the phloem. So in the phloem, you know there's going to be translocation. So this was the answer to this was, so if you knew that, only then you would know it, that the inside is the xylem and the outside is the phloem and the phloem, there's only going to be translocation. There can't be transpiration is also not correct. Transpiration would not take place here in the xylem and xylem, it's just going to be the uh, suction force, which is going to make water flow by mass flow up into the xylem and to the stem. This is a stem. Transpiration occurs in the leaves. That could be a very good MCQ. 13, the graph shows changes in the blood pressure on the left ventricle of the heart. During which period is the left atrium contracting? You see, you have to understand it. They were not asking the left ventricle. The graph is about the left ventricle pressure. So when the pressure, the left atria has to contract, this is showing you the pressure. Please understand, this is showing you the pressure in the ventricle rising. Pressure in the ventricle can only rise when the atria works here and pumps the blood. So this is the ventricle and this is the left side. So this is the left atrium. This is the left atrium. This is the left ventricle. So if pressure rises here, then pressure has to, the blood has to go in here. So it had to be the earlier part and it is A. And that is when the pressure rises and then the pressure starts to fall. That is when the ventricle is emptying. And then of course the next cycle. 
So during which period is the left atrium contracting? So the left atrium would be contracting here because then the left atrium contracts, blood goes in here and then the valves close. This valve closes, the bicuspid valve closes and then of course the left ventricle is going to contract and is going to press onto the blood and the blood is going to be pushed into the aorta. The diagram shows cross sections of two blood vessels P and Q. What type of blood vessels are they? Now you know that the small lumen has to be an artery and the large lumen has to be a vein. Now this is something which you have to know factually that thick wall, arteries, thick wall, thin wall, veins. So P was an artery and Q was a vein. You need to revise this chapter if you're not very clear. This is couldn't have been a capillary because why a capillary is only one cell thick. It doesn't even have a wall. It doesn't have it's only one cell thick. So if you look at a diagram of an artery, vein and a capillary, it's just the internal, this, this only this part is left in a, a capillary, you only have this part. Like if I have to color it another color, it would be this part. Capillary only has this endothelium, which is the inner lining. Then coming on to question number 15, the diagram shows a section of a capillary. Which arrow represents tissue fluid formation? You have to understand this is the arterial end. So if this is the arterial end, the pressure is very high. Why? Because all arteries arise from the aorta. And the aorta arises from the left ventricle. And the wall of the left ventricle is very thick. So that exerts a lot of force. And that is why A would be uh, arrow represent tissue fluid formation. Of course, this is now returning. This is tissue fluid returning. This is the venous end. So by this time, the pressure has greatly decreased as it is flowing through the capillary from the arterial end to the venous end. So that is why the answer to this was A. Then question 16, what is not a feature of alveoli, but doesn't have any cilia? No cilia in the alveoli. So no cilia in the alveoli, the rest of it is large surface area, yes, moist surface, yes, walls one cell thick, yes, all but if I said what is a feature of alveoli, and all these three would be correct. Large surface area, moist surface, walls one cell thick. But it said not, which is not a feature. So the not was the one which you had to really re, uh, sort of read to yourself and understand that was the question. Question 17, which structures contract to cause us to breathe out with force when sneezing? The internal intercostal muscles, because you see, you have to understand is that when we sneeze, it's a forced exhalation, like when you cough. So internal intercostal muscles have to contract and sort of press on the lungs for you to exhale out forcefully. Like if you just cough, <coughs> well, it's a forced exhalation. Everybody should try and cough and see what you're doing. It's a forced exhalation. And when you cough, it's a forced exhalation. So that is the internal intercostal muscles will contract. Then coming to question number 18, the diagram shows the human exchange system. One is the trachea. Uh, two is the bronchus, four is alveoli, and five is, of course, the bronchiole. So what are the labeled parts? Trachea, bronchus, bronchiole, and alveolus. So that was easy. I think everybody got that correct. That was, this is the heart. This part is the heart. And then these are the two lungs which they've shown. This is the diaphragm. And then you can see these are the ribs. And then you can see these are the external intercostal muscles. And then let me give another color. These are the internal intercostal muscles. So the external and the internal intercostal muscle, these will be the external ones. So just a quick revision. And I hope this is helpful to all of you when you get an MCQ which uh, challenges this syllabus part. Then coming on to the next question, 19. The diagram shows a simplified dialysis machine, clean dialysis fluid in. So then this is the dialysis fluid as this is all here, 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 and here it's coming out. And then you have the blood flow in. So let's give the blood a red color, blood flow in and blood flow. Yeah, the blood flow is coming in here. Sorry, it's coming in here and it's going out here, right? So blood flow in and out, then there's a dialysis membrane. How do the urea concentrations in the blood and the dialysis fluid change? Yes, naturally in the blood, they're going to decrease. That's why we put people on dialysis. We want 
the blood urea to become less because the blood urea is very damaging, is very toxic for the brain. The person goes into uremic coma if his kidneys fail. So urea concentration in the blood will decrease because the urea is going to move out into the dialysis fluid. Uh, so naturally it's going to increase in the dialysis fluid because it's going to increase and then of course, but the dialysis fluid is continuously being changed. So that is the reason why we change it because otherwise then the urea will accumulate in the dialysis fluid and that could result in all the urea then not diffusing out anymore. Then coming on to question number 20. What helps heat retention in the human body? Helps heat retention, just like you want to uh, keep something hot, so you keep it in a hot pot. So similarly, the hot pot is an insulating layer. So fat in and under the skin is the main thing which is going to insulate the body. So this is what we had to Uh, this is what we have to understand that helps heat retention in the body, fat in and under the skin. The other thing, uh, secreting sweat glands would of course cool the body down. Dilated blood vessels, um, vasodilation, more heat lost. So retain, won't heat, relaxed hair and rectum muscles. So that's all, you know, wrong. You have to call, you have to read the question. What helps heat retention in the human body? Diagram shows a section through the human brain. Which part is the cerebellum? Everybody knows that this is this part, which is the leaf-like part. This is called the cerebellum. So the answer was C. Uh, B was the cerebrum. A was the uh, medulla. D was the spinal cord. So this is what you have to know, the labeling of the brain, which is a very common question that they give you very often and the labeling. So a person, number question 22, a person is reading a book in dim light. Which row shows the state of the eye muscles? Now, we have to understand dim light means pupil has to be wider. Pupil has to be wider. So the circular muscles have to be relaxed and the radial muscles have to be contracted. And the ciliary muscle has to, con why do the ciliary muscle have to contract? Why? Because when you're looking at something near, book, the, uh, con the lens has to be more convex, near more convex. So this is what you have to remember is dim light, pupil wider, and the lens more convex. Then coming to question number 23. Which chemical produced by the body alters the activity of a target organ and is destroyed by the liver? Very easy. It was This is the exact definition in the syllabus. It's a hormone. Produced by the body alters, body alters the activity of a target organ. That's the exact syllabus point that it is. So this is what we have to understand. Then question number 24. Which statement about the ulna is correct? It has a protection to which an extensor muscle is attached. You see, this is the humerus right and then let me give it another color this is the ulna and you know in the front you have the biceps muscle and on the on the back you have the triceps muscle and the triceps muscle actually attaches to the and the triceps muscle is actually the extensor muscle so flexion means you bend the arm at the elbow and that's when the biceps works and the biceps is not even attached. Actually, the biceps is attached to the radius here. So biceps is attached here. This is the biceps. This is the triceps. Triceps is also called the extra extensor muscle. Extensor means extension. Like you bend your arm at the elbow, flexion. Then you extend your arm at the elbow, extension. So the triceps is the one which is going to extend the arm. So that is why it has a projection to which an extensor muscle is attached. Now this was a very, very difficult, I think this was a difficult point, which unless you know it, you really won't be able to do this question. Now, of course, these were all wrong. We're in joint with the shoulder. So anything or the shoulder was wrong, scapula was wrong. So you have to only figure out between A and C. If it fits into a notch on the radius, I'm sorry. Allah cannot fit onto the radius. Allah and radius are two separate bones. Okay, that finishes this video. We'll continue the rest on the next video. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is question one to question 24. And thank you.